Hi, I'm Becca from Worker Bee Supply, and I'm so excited to bring you a new episode in What the Hell Do You Do? Our new series that explores the interesting and unique ways that people make a living. So today we're sitting down with Carrie Marsh, who I'm very excited to talk to. So Carrie Marsh, what the hell do you do? <gasps> Hi. Hello. Uh, I'm a writer and an editor, and the other day someone called me a micro-influencer, which made me laugh hysterically, but it's also kind of uh, a part of my new uh, career. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. So what types of things do you write and edit? And micro-influence. And micro-influence. <laughs> That's the case. So I started my uh, career writing about fashion, okay. uh, but since then I have moved uh, towards food and health and uh, a little bit about restaurants and kids and family. And I would say that's where I have a micro influence. Okay, interesting. So where exactly are you doing all this writing? I mostly write on my site, which I have with my business partner, and it's yeah. called Sweet Potato Chronicles, which we launched about six or seven years ago, which okay. is just crazy. And it's a hub for all the sort of recipes and uh, parenting strategies and sort of cooking tips that we have accumulated. And from Sweet Potato Chronicles, we have um, published one cookbook and are about to publish another. Amazing. Uh, we create videos, we, and then we've sort of established a, a social network too. But we think of um, okay. SPC as the hub for all of it. So mm -hmm. how did you find, with your partner that you work with, how did you guys come together and, and realize that you had a common interest that mm -hmm. you realized you could share with the world? Well, Laura and I worked at Fashion Magazine together okay. for almost 10 years. Amazing. Um, and so at that time, we were colleagues and, um, you know, both interested in fashion and beauty. And then we had our kids at around the same time. Okay. So we were on mat leave together. Uh, our daughters started eating solids. I mean, it seems like such a crazy thing that that was what changed the, the direction of my career, but it's really true. And we would be on the phone with each other constantly, like, you know, what order should you introduce foods? And what's the deal with vitamin D levels changing? And, and because we come from a journalistic background, we would really treat it with that um, research mentality and sort of best practices mentality. So we would literally say to each other, okay, you research vitamin D and I'll research like, you know, introduction order of foods. And we would go out there and kind of report back to each other. Okay. And what we realized was a lot of the um, media out there for parents is either super dry or super condescending. So there was a lot of recipes for like itsy bitsy greeny beanies and we were like, you know, so <laughs> gross. And we just started kind of talking about, you know, how to find that information, but also, yeah. you know, what if we could use our skills as journalists um, and kind of combine it with the life stage we were at and start something new. And we were both like looking for a change anyway. Okay. Um, and then that's really how SBC was born. We were like, well, why couldn't we create something that was good looking, which was like, that was just essential to us as snobby fashion girls, but that spoke to women in a way that we wanted to be spoken to, mm -hmm. women and men, I should say. Uh, and we wanted to be able to say to our audience, like, what the fuck are we making for dinner? Like, you know, because that's the conversation that's really happening. Yeah. So that's really at the heart of what we do is, is that sort of respectful, warm, helpful, funny tone. Yeah, that's true because from the look of the blog, it does still have like a very professional, slick feel to it. Yeah. It's not cutesy, you don't yeah. have pastel colors. Yeah. So it's not necessarily like geared towards children, No. but it's still like very professional and very adult. It's so interesting to say that because so a lot of parenting material looks like it's aimed at kids, yeah. which always struck me as bizarre. It's like, yeah. I'm still the same person who has Prada shoes in her closet. Why are you? <laughs> trying to make yeah. it look like a teddy bear. Like, why does that sandwich have to look like a teddy bear? Yeah, exactly. And I find just like, I know that a big part of the blog and, and what you and your partner do is, is including the kids yeah. in the cooking process. Yeah. Yeah. But again, this way the blog can still like appeal to moms and yeah. dads out there without just being like baby overload all the yeah. time. Well, and even our message on that front, it's like, we really believe in family food, not kid food. Yeah. So even when we're t cooking with our kids or introducing them to new things, like my kids eat squid and, you know, because we didn't decide like, oh my God, it's gotta be chicken fingers. So that sort of approach, it 
I think that's really important though because like from what I've seen online, a lot of people just assume that that's what kids want to eat, like yes. pizza, chicken fingers. Yeah. But if you introduce those more like exotic foods to yeah. them yeah. when they're younger, yeah. then that's just going to be a part of their life from then on. I mean, so I amazing. think people probably want to throw stuff at me when yeah. I say this, but it's like, of course they want chicken fingers if that's what you give them. They're delicious. <laughs> they're delicious. <laughs> and they're so easy and not yeah. challenging. And so you have to be willing to kind of go through a little suffering of, you know, someone rejecting your food, which sucks. But yeah, it sure. depends what your goal is at the end of the day. And that's to me is I don't want to eat that and I would just want to make one dinner. Yeah. So in terms of you have your partner, but is there any other forms of like collaboration that take place within the blog and what sort of opportunities have come about um, from, from writing? Um, well, we collaborate a lot with our photographer, Maya Visney. Yeah. She's really been essential to our brand and the blog and to our cookbooks. Um, and it's been interesting to me at sort of how similar it is to shooting fashion and beauty. F shooting okay. food and shooting yeah. beauty in particular are really similar. They're very particular. It's very picky. You know, if it's a little bit wrong, it's all wrong, yeah. you know. So I think that's been really interesting to sort of see how a, a lot of the skills that Laura and I had are completely applicable to this new format. And then I think the other thing that's different is you know, when we got into it is really when sort of social platforms were really taking off. So that's been um, something new for us and, and new ways to think about publishing is, you know, yes, blogs are still a, an interesting thing to have. And I sort of feel like if you're going to be a digital brand, you need that hub. Yeah. But really, you know, publishing is moving on to these other platforms. Yeah. And, and that took, I think, a while for me as like a traditional media person. It took me a while to kind of figure that out. Like, oh, right. I'm actually publishing in 10 different places, mm -hmm. not just in this one place. And I, I can't even really worry about the website too much anymore. I, I really have to think about, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and Instagram oh, and YouTube yeah. and, and how all those things are slightly different and you have to engage with them differently. And so that's been a huge learning curve, but also exciting and challenging. So if you were to start everything over again mm -hmm. and relaunch Sweet Potato Chronicles, but it wasn't as a blog, right. what platform do you think you would take? Or you It's so hard to say. Maybe YouTube? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like YouTube is like, um, <laughs> it's a mature platform now. It's not like it's brand new. <laughs> it's not a baby anymore. No, it's not a baby anymore. Um, but I do feel like, you know, and that's just about the strengths that Laura and I have you know that we're comfortable on camera and that we, we enjoy that process so that would work for us okay. but I think I, I yeah I, I think no matter what even if I was starting a business today I think you have to have a website just because people have to find you and not you know the crafts and the you know milk boards and the gaps you know what I mean those big brands aren't necessarily gonna search for you on YouTube yeah. So if you're hoping to sort of have a presence, I think you still need a URL. Um, but in terms of like where to pour your efforts, I think you really have to think about what your brand is. Are you a visual brand? Are you a brand that, you know, where people need to see you and hear from you? And is your information best taken in, you know, in a written form? So I think you have to think about like what you are and what you offer. But I do feel like video is, you know, it's huge right now, but it's only going to get bigger. Yeah, for sure. So you kind of have to figure out like what your destination is going to be for your audience. That's but it's, it's yeah. tough though when you're starting out, you don't always yeah. know the answer. So I think you have to sort of be open to that like spirit of experimentation and, yeah. and investigation and try. But um, I do think you always have to come back to like what is it we're doing? Because I yeah. think the problem that some publishers have is that they try to sort of be too many things and then it comes across as kind of nothing. Was it hard for you originally to like stand out? Or were you able to kind of like use your past resources? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. That's totally I mean, I think so. we really had an advantage in that we had a lot of relationships yeah. in traditional media. So basically within, I don't know, two or three months of launching, probably well before we had earned <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah. we had sort of um, some, some stock with people. So we were doing yeah. morning shows and we were getting featured in parenting magazines. And so okay. that really helped to kind of catapult what we were doing. And one of the things that I found really interesting is just how much more open digital people are than traditional media. In my role at Fashion Magazine, yeah. in a million years, I never would have phoned up the editor-in-chief at Flair and said, God, I'm really struggling with covers and what, am, what do you do about newsstand? And, you know, never, yeah. never, never, never. Whereas uh, in digital, I 100% uh, would phone up 
you know, the editor in chief of Savvy Mom or, or, yeah. you know, and said like, SEO, like what's the, <laughs> how do I, you know, game that shit? And people would 100% take the call and tell you everything they knew. There wasn't, there okay. isn't and wasn't that sense of like, I don't know, I, I mean, there's definitely competition, but there wasn't that feeling of like, there's only enough for me and I'm, I'm going to protect what I've got. Yeah. And I, I find that really fun and exciting and, and it's just great. I think it's great. So someone that doesn't have necessarily those kinds of resources going yeah. in and starting a new project like a blog or mm -hmm. even like a YouTube channel, do you have any tips that you could provide? I think you have to decide what your goals are. If your goals are traffic, yeah. it's really hard. <laughs> traffic is the hardest thing and uh, it's, it's, I think it's really hard to get to a place where you could make money through effort, you know? I mean, obviously you have to be creating good content, that's like the price of entry, but I, I do think that it's really tough. I think what you need to do is, um, if, if, you, if your goal is traffic, you need to find a way to partner with a bigger player. But the good news is, you know, people want to partner with smaller content creators. So yeah. I think, you know, if you can try to do content exchanges with a bigger player that yeah. can drive traffic to you, that's the number one way of kind of getting a boost. Um, you really have to embrace the community that you're in and kind of, you know, be on other people's sites or, you know, invite people to be on your site. Um, you know, it, I think it's really important to to embed yourself in a community and, and it will help you kind of rise, you know. I know, that's totally true. Like if you can, if you have like a specific interest, there is someone who has that interest as well. Totally. And that can be on any like social media platform or, or YouTube or a blog. Mm -hmm. um, so just, yeah, kind of finding your people. And, and don't think of them as your competition. Think yeah. of them as your allies. And I, and I think the good news there is that most people in digital welcome that, that sort of I know it's kind of like this this feeling that we're all in this together yeah. and like yeah you might have like more readers per month or you yeah. might have like more subscribers yeah. if you can find someone who's in that just you know a little bit higher than you yeah. but you you have like a common interest or something you could collaborate on that would be like a, it's a huge benefit and for and sure. also I think all I think this is just true in life yeah. is is to not just think about oh, what can I get how can I get people to help me think about what you can do for people yeah I think that's a huge uh, point of difference is when you're, I, I was in a meeting the other day, Laura and I were in a meeting with um, a, a corporate client of ours or mm -hmm. you know, partner of ours and we went into the meeting saying here's what we'd like to create for you and she said do you know that no one ever does this? People come to us saying will you sponsor me for a year? Yeah. And so we always try to come from a place of like what can we offer? What can we offer to potential clients? What can we offer to other people? Like I always try to give shout outs to other small publishers on our Facebook page and I, th I think try to offer something. Yeah, so that's something you should definitely think about before going in to either a meeting or having a phone conversation. Yeah, is, what are you bringing? Yeah. Don't just think about like, what am I going to get out of this? Yeah. I think it's, I don't think people, first of all, people just don't like it. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And it doesn't, why would anyone want to work with you if all you're interested in is like what you can get? You're like, you're just like such a big inspiration. It would be so amazing to... So what are your um, plans going forward with either the blog or like opportunities you have with doing stuff online mm -hmm. or TV spots or things in newspapers? Because I know Sweet Potato Chronicles is kind of all over the place. I know. We're sort of... <laughs> Which is great. We're in so many places. <laughs> well, back to what I was saying earlier yeah. about partnering with other people. We, you know, we do a, a daily column in Metro News. Yeah. We're on Global Morning Show once a month. You know, we're always trying to like work with other people and yeah. sort of offer our content to those people. Um, we're looking at joining a video group. We'll see, you know, um, a video platform. Okay. We're in thinking about that. We're um, creating a video series to go along with our new cookbook, which is coming out in the summer, which is all about the school year. We're really, we're always sort of looking at all our platforms and sort of seeing where we can put our focus, because it's just the two of us, so we, we can't do everything. Um, but we're having a lot of fun with uh, Instagram these days, is a big focus for us. and. Um, We'll see what comes of that. And you just, I, I feel like if you just sort of keep putting out the content that you're most passionate about, the right kind of partners are going to gravitate to you. And okay. so, yeah, we're looking at creating a video series with a couple of clients and partners in the fall to go to Secret go with the clients book. and partners. Yeah. Oh, I know. I hate it when people are like that. Like, I can't <laughs> okay. talk about it. It's just top secret. I know. But I can't yeah. Say anything. 
So you talked a little bit earlier about traffic and, and getting people to, to come to the blog. Yeah. Um, but since that's not your main goal as a business, how do you and your partner make money then with the blog? Well, first of all, if I knew how to crack the nut of traffic, I would be doing it okay. all day long because I, 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 it's definitely powerful. Um, but it's just it's hard for, for small publishers to, to do it. So yeah. we just have never put our focus there because we've realized, you know, I would say that there were about two years when I put, I don't know, 80% of my efforts toward traffic. And our traffic was good, but it was never, you know, at those levels that people talk about or yeah. that you see some American bloggers yeah. hitting. So, so just to say that, I, you know, we did take a run at it, but it's just was never... It was just never an easy um, thing for us. And so what we always focused on was the quality of what we do and the fact that there was sort of a, there's sort of a polish to what we do that I think not everyone competes with us on. And so we know that when we work with um, particularly certain corporate partners, KitchenAid, Cuisinart, Gap, um, you know, all these sort of partners, Canadian Tire, that we've dealt with, what they like is that, you know, we're comfortable to do media, we, are you know, have a taste level when it comes to our photography. And so, you know, I think you can catapult yourself into the world of micro-influencer um, by doing things at a certain level. Okay. And I think to get there, you, I guess, just have to... I guess just really look around and see like what looks good to people right now and what's appealing and can you uh, deliver your content in an authentic way and still have it look and sound great because yeah. I think you know I think authenticity is something you hear a lot about when you know you talk about small businesses and I think it really is important um, that a lot of advertisers want to work with influencers because of that auth authenticity factor that people don't necessarily want to be marketed to in the same old traditional ways that people are sort of suspicious of that. And so I think it's something that influencers have to almost kind of bottle is that that's what you've got that either a big publisher doesn't have and an advertiser doesn't have, right? That you're in the middle as a, as a small publisher or creator, what you've got is authenticity. You don't have very much else. So you really have to hold on to it yeah. and you can make it look rough. You can make it look beautiful but that's the thing that you can't budge on, or else you're in the no man's land of, of the internet, right? In between big publishers and advertisers. So can you talk a little bit more about like actually making money then? You right. should, like you talked about how brands look for authenticity and how you can really show that with the, with the content that you put out, yeah. but with working with various brands or having, even writing books yeah. or being on TV, yeah. are you, finding that, that that's really beneficial in terms of like having a salary or just yep. making money from it? Yeah. So the ways, I mean, the way it plays out for us yeah. is that um, clients will come to us and ask us, you know, to do a bunch of different things. But for example, we'll get paid to, to make media appearances. Okay. So, you know, a, a, a a food company or a you know an appliance company might come to us and say we have a new product and we want to pitch you to morning shows yeah. and because we have relationships with the producers because the producers know that we will be subtle in how we weave it in it's a very special skill <laughs> and you know we happen to know how to do that so we will get booked on morning shows and and you know we'll incorporate a client into a segment that isn't necessarily about them but that uses them and so that's okay. Turns out that that's a skill that that clients are willing to pay for. So that, that's okay. something that we do regularly. Okay. Um, what's another way to make money? Um, we'll do we'll create posts or videos for people, um, appearances. We'll do events. So it's basically representing um, a product or a brand in some yeah, way exactly. uh, in the media, whether that's social media or traditional media, and that's a way to make money. <laughs> it's one way to make money. Yeah. Yeah. Have you found that when you launched your first cookbook and with your second cookbook coming out, has that been, was that really like a fruitful endeavor? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, it was. Well, making books is not a fruitful endeavor, yeah. especially cookbooks. They're terrifically expensive to do. Yeah. They're super labor intensive, but um, it puts you out there in a way. And so then, you know, hopefully clients kind of come. Um, and this time around, because we sort of saw that process last time, yeah. now we're proactive. So now we have an agent who books all of our um, client-oriented stuff for us. And so 
you know, the book doesn't come out until July. We've been in meetings with our agent for months now saying, here's what's coming. You know, we know that we'll already be out in the media promoting the book. Let's go to clients in advance, okay. telling them all about the book, about how much press we'll be doing, and try to book some extra gigs around that time. It benefits okay. them. It benefits us. So, you know, it, it's interesting to see the, all the other businesses that are kind of coming up around mm -hmm. influencers or micro-influencers. There's now, you know, agents like ours who yeah. it's her job to book gigs for people like us. Yeah, so it's... There's a structure around it now, which is crazy. So that's interesting. So even with your partners and, and your publishing background and, and working at the magazine, mm -hmm. just releasing a book seemed like it had a big learning curve to it. And yeah. you're being able, well, just like so many different parts involved. Yeah. So you're taking all the things you learned from releasing your first book yeah. and kind of getting ahead yes. and making sure you don't do things wrong um, when you're yeah. releasing your second. Yeah. Because you okay. really you have a window, right? When you, whenever you put something out, yeah, I feel like you have a sort of a window where people might be paying attention. Mm -hmm. So you want to try to make the most of that. Yeah. So you're constantly learning, basically. Yes. <laughs> yes. So. Learning addict. Amazing. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share for us today? Um, well, you should definitely go to Sweet Potato Chronicles and find a dinner recipe for tonight. <laughs> Do you have like a favorite go-to recipe <laughs> on the blog? It's, it's always changing. I think my very favorite recipe that we've ever done is called shakshuka. Um, and it's like a, it's a Middle Eastern dish. It's tomatoes in a skillet and you crack eggs on top and it's super delicious and right. comes together in about 15 minutes. Thank you so much for joining us today, Carrie. Thanks I for really, me. <laughs> you're welcome. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to chat with us and tell us a little bit more about the blogging world and what it's like being a micro-influencer. <laughs> So fascinating. So glamorous. <laughs> uh, and of course, if you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe because we have lots more videos coming your way very soon. Thanks a lot.